go ahead and get your Bibles out and we'll prepare for the preaching this morning. It is a new month. It is June already. And I wonder what the month of June means to you. I thought it was going to mean sunshine and a little bit of heat. Apparently I haven't lived in this area for long enough. Apparently month of June does not mean that. But according to our nation and according to our state and according to our city, June does have a meaning and uh, it's Pride Month is what they call it. And so this is what was put out by the leadership of our nation just this Friday. Uh, Now, therefore, I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim June 2024 as Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, and Intersex Pride Month. I call upon the people of the United States to recognize the achievements of the LGBTQI community, to celebrate the great diversity of the American people and to wave their flags of pride high. And this morning in the city of Gig Harbor, there is a flag that is flying at City Hall that says, we are proud of this. Uh, And that is going on across our nation and will uh, not just this month, but particularly this month. And we are in the midst of a national and, and I would argue, global celebration of rebellion against the way that God created and designed things to be. Satan's preachers are instant in season and out of season. Satan's propaganda does not take a break. And if you live and operate and work in this world you will be preached to on a regular basis that this is something to be proud of. This is something to accept. This is something to celebrate. uh, This is something to glory in. And you will receive that message in the music of this world and in any TV that you watch, movies and television shows. It will be preached to you on social media. It will be preached to you by the religious organizations, not just of our nation and not just of our state, but of our town. Uh, We have uh, one of the largest denominations, uh, so-called Christian denominations in our country, the United Methodist Church, uh, just this month said, we are all for everything that has to do with LGBTQ. Uh, We are not against it. The Pope uh, has made statements over the course of his time as Pope saying, uh, who am I to judge? Uh, And so this message is preached on a regular basis. We are inundated and surrounded by it. And so you can file this morning's sermon under the category of fortifying and maintaining a biblical worldview. I don't preach uh, what I'm going to preach this morning because I necessarily think anybody here is in disagreement with this. But my desire is to strengthen your convictions in what the word of God has to say and to uh, verify and, and solidify our conviction that what God has to say on the matter is what's important and what we're going to stand on. I'm not preaching this in downtown Gig Harbor, and I'm not going to stand up and preach this uh, when they have their event later this month celebrating uh, Pride in the Park. Uh, I'm not going to stand with a megaphone and, and preach this message to them. I'm preaching this message to you this morning because the battlefield is not in our courts and our school systems and our legislature. The battle is in Christians' minds and hearts. Uh, And that's where sometimes we get this wrong, is we are are willing to be outraged at what's going on in other people's lives, uh, but the battle that Satan wants to win and the battle that Satan wants to fight is in your mind and is in your heart. That's where it starts, and so that's what we're going to try and do this morning And the challenge is simply this, you need to be resolved, I'm going to side with God on this issue. When God contradicts what the world tells me, I'm going to take God's side. When God contradicts what the school tells me, I'm going to be on God's side. When God contradicts what my family members tell me, I'm going to be on God's side. That's the challenge this morning. And so uh, if you want a title because you're taking notes, here's simply the title. It would be Dissecting Sodom. Dissecting Sodom. Let's turn to Genesis Uh, chapter 13, it doesn't take very long in the Bible for God to deal with this issue 
Because God's not surprised by what's happening in the United States in 2024. This is something God has dealt with for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so we're not even halfway through the first book of the Bible before God gives us some information that would help us to have a biblical mindset on this. We won't stand this morning. We'll be several places in the scriptures. And so I would encourage you to keep your Bibles out and ready and, and keep your fingers warmed up. Uh, we'll, we'll look at several different passages. Starting in Genesis 13, verse number 12, the Bible says this, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That's our introduction to this town. Lot pitched his tent facing that direction. And the Bible simply tells us that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. It's bad to be a sinner. It's bad to be a sinner and wicked. It's really bad to be a sinner and wicked before the Lord exceedingly. The adjectives and adverbs in the Bible are not just filler. They're used for emphasis. It's as if the Holy Ghost underlines and bolds this statement that whatever was happening in Sodom and in the lives of its citizens and inhabitants was something that God was vehemently opposed to. Turn over to Genesis 19 now. Genesis chapter 19. So Lot, Abraham's nephew, has uh, pitched his tent in the direction of this city. Some time has passed. We're not sure exactly how much. And we find this account recorded for us in Genesis chapter 19, and I'll begin reading in verse number one. The Holy Bible says this, and there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. In chapter 13, Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. He faced that direction. He was inclined towards them. Now, as time has passed, he is in the gate. He is integrated into the community. He's integrated into the culture and the society and it says, Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. This is standard hospitality in ancient Near East uh, culture. Somebody's traveling. There's not hotels and uh, motels and inns on every corner. It's expected that when strangers come through, they would be housed and fed, and Lot has done that. Uh, it's also important to note that we are told that these are angels. If you read the surrounding context, uh, the angels did not show up at Lot's house with big shiny white wings and a halo and shining clothes. They're described simply as men. Uh, and the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that even in this present day, uh, we are to be hospitable because many have entertained angels unawares. Uh, and so angels is not what the children's book make them look like. They are presented simply as men. And it says, you couldn't tell the difference. And Lot, I don't believe, could in this case. He's simply treating guests to the city uh, with good hospitality. Verse four says, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. This is not a vocal minority. This is the consensus opinion of the town. They called unto Lot, verse five, and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? They simply understood that there were strangers in town. They didn't understand that these were God's very angelic messengers. Bring them out unto us that we may know them. That's the Bible sense of the word to know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. 
But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Look with me at verse number 24. The Bible says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. I want to go back to Lot for a brief moment and consider the gradual process that happened in Lot's life where he initially went from pitching his tent towards Sodom to now being in a position where he is uh, an integral member of the community. The gate is where respected men and leaders in the community sat. And so he is accepted in that place. The Bible in the New Testament describes Lot as a just and righteous man. We would call him in, in our New Testament terms, he was a saved man. He was a man who believed in God, but he's living in Sodom of his own accord. It's voluntary. It's his choice. And the Bible says, uh, this is in 2 Peter chapter 2, that Lot vexed his righteous soul, seeing and hearing their wicked deeds. And so this didn't start when the guests showed up and when Lot's house was surrounded by an angry mob from the city. The whole time Lot was living in Sodom, he knew that what was going on in that city was wicked. He knew that it was unrighteous what was happening in that city. But I want you to see what happens to him after months upon months and years upon years of living in the middle of this wicked city. Lot believes and Lot understands and Lot agrees with God that what the crowd outside wants to do to his guests is wicked. Lot understands that. Lot is even outraged that somebody would uh, suggest a, a man lying with mankind. That's wrong and that's wicked. And he immediately follows it up with a vile suggestion that take my children, take my daughters and do whatever you want to them. That will appease you. Just don't do this level of wickedness. And when you pitch your tent towards Sodom and when you open your door and see and hear and look at what the world is preaching and when you listen to the world's music and when you watch the world's movies and you put the sin of Sodom in front of your face, you're going to end up drawing lines that are not where God's lines are drawn. I hope that where Lot drew this line makes you sick, that he was willing to say, take my daughters, you can have your way with my children, you can defile my children, just don't do this sin. And this is what's happened in our nation, and this starts far beyond even my lifetime. We have Christians, and we have uh, those who are conservative socially, who say, I can't believe that people would take their children to a doctor and have them mutilated because of the confusion that is in their minds. I can't believe that people would commit these kinds of sexual perversions and we draw the line up here and God says, how about back here where I drew the line? How about keeping your children's innocence? How about keeping your purity back here and, and we get all outraged over here and we end up like Lot if we allow the world to preach to us, if we allow Satan to infiltrate our thinking and our worldview, we end up the same way Lot did and he's in a, in a bad place. He's not wrong about the sin that is happening. He's not wrong that it's wicked, but he's so far gone that uh, he is in the same breath saying just uh, really unbelievable things that should be to us uh, but he's outraged at somebody else's sin here. And you should not underestimate how quickly the world can desensitize you to the sin of Sodom. If you'd asked Lot before he ever moved into Sodom, if he would ever say a thing like he says in verse number eight, I don't think he ever suspected he would get to that point, but he's so desensitized. He's been surrounded by seeing and hearing the deeds of Sodom uh, that he's outraged at the LGBTQ agenda, but he's doing nothing to protect the purity and the innocence of his own children in his own household. 
And we have Christians across our country uh, that profess to know Christ and are outraged at uh, the transgender agenda and are doing nothing to perfect the purity and the innocence and the holiness of their own children in their own home. And in the same breath as they're uh, uh, preaching against wicked things that they would never do, they're piping in the world's sewer into their house through the TVs and the phones and the tablets and the things that they're watching and the things that they're listening to and the things that are going through the earbuds and the headphones uh, that are just uh, vile deeds. We're not doing them, but we'll let those things be preached in our houses. And it desensitizes and, and ends up lot up in the place where he uh, is found here in Genesis chapter 19. And I believe because it's true that Genesis 19 is a literal, factual, historical account. This is not an allegory. This is not a story to try and make a point. This is history where God looked down at a wicked city and said, I'm going to make an example out of them to everybody who ever lives ungodly that I am willing and able to harshly judge sin. That's Bible phrase. That's not me uh, summarizing that. You find that in 2 Peter 2 and in Jude chapter 1. Uh, what happened in Sodom is described as God setting an example for the rest of human history so that people know God judges sin. Now, God does not always judge sin the way he judged Sodom's sin. And I'm standing here this morning and you're sitting here this morning because God has not struck you down for every sin that you've committed. God is long-suffering. God is merciful. God is loving. God is patient. And God gets no joy in the death of the wicked. He has no pleasure in judging sin. But throughout history and throughout the Bible, we find God puts a, a, a marker down in human history as if to say, I don't want to destroy you. I don't want to condemn you. I don't want to rain down fire and brimstone, but I'm going to do this to warn everybody else who would think about living ungodly. I hate sin. And so in Noah's day, when every imagination of the thoughts of men's heart was only evil continually, God said, I'm going to send a flood and destroy the entire human race save for eight souls. So that everybody knows how much I despise and detest sin. And he does that in Sodom. And it's one thing for us to look at uh, the world in Noah's day or the world in Lot's day and to uh, sit, as it were, in the bleachers and condemn them. But we have the same kind of examples made for us in a New Testament church. In Acts chapter number five, a couple comes to uh, Peter as the leadership of the church of Jerusalem and begins to lie in the middle of God's house. Uh, begins to say, we uh, sold our house for this much and we're bringing the full price to you. And really, they only brought half the price. And they dropped dead. God doesn't do that every time I've told a lie. I wouldn't be here. God hasn't done that to you every time you've told a lie. But God put that marker down in Bible history so that I would know when I'm dishonest, that's how God feels about it. And here's what's happened in Sodom. It's not that God rains down fire and brimstone every time somebody does what has been done in Sodom, but he marks this down so there's an example. This is how I feel about that. And just because I'm long-suffering and just because I'm patient, you should not think that my opinion has changed or that my viewpoint or my stance has changed. God hates sin and he will one day judge it. But I'd like to ask this question this morning. Again, our, our topic or our goal is to dissect Sodom. There's more here than meets the eye. And I want to ask this question, why specifically did God destroy Sodom? What exactly went on in God's thought process? What exactly did God see that caused him to pull the trigger, as it were? It wasn't the attempted assault that happened because those men were in Sodom to destroy the city before the mob ever surrounded Lot's house. That's the reason they were in that city in the first place. So something happened before this point that caused God to decide, I'm going to destroy this city. Now, there's two common explanations for the sin of Sodom to identify what exactly was the problem. And I believe both of them are very incomplete. In churches like ours, it would be common to hear this summary given 
that people in Sodom committed acts of homosexuality and God destroyed the city with fire and brimstone because of that. That, that would be uh, common to hear preached in Baptist churches like ours. On the other side, uh, just across the highway in churches like the United Methodist Church and, and other liberal denominations in our town, uh, people would give this uh, explanation that the sin of Sodom was that they did not properly treat the strangers that came through. They were inhospitable, had nothing to do with their sexual deviancy. It was the fact that they uh, had a desire to mistreat guests to their city and it violated the norms of hospitality and caring for those that were traveling and caring for those that didn't have a place to stay. And that's the real sin of Sodom. And again, the point of the message this morning is to verify what does the Bible say? Not what does a Baptist preacher say? Not what does a Methodist minister say? What does God say about what happened in Sodom? Because it's important for us to not just make assumptions on either side, but rather to see what God's word has to say. And again, I believe we'll find that there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. Look at Isaiah chapter one this morning. We're going to survey briefly some portions of scripture where Sodom is referred to and try and understand what exactly was the problem in Sodom. Isaiah chapter one, we are now... Uh, we fast forwarded many, many centuries since the days of Lot. Sodom has been a barren wasteland, an ash heap for centuries when Isaiah is prophesying. But it obviously is uh, fixed in their memory. It's fixed in their history of what God did in Sodom. And in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 10, God addresses the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. God's chosen people. And he calls them Sodomites. He doesn't use that word. But look at this in Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. The city of Sodom had not been rebuilt in Isaiah's day. There's no literal city of Sodom. He's referring back to what they knew of the Genesis account and saying, this is you. You're Sodom. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Isaiah preached to a congregation of God's people and called them the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And look at verse number 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. And he goes on in that same vein for several verses, but I want you to see this that Isaiah is preaching to a group of people who are, to put it in our terms, they're attending church. They're giving in the offerings. They're celebrating Christmas and Easter, and they're going to the special meetings, and they're there for the assemblies. They're in God's house, and God says to that congregation, you're a bunch of sodomites. You're rulers of Sodom and people of Gomorrah. Look at verse number 16. Let's try to understand why God would say that to his own chosen people, who have God's law and who are in God's house, why would he refer to them as Sodom and Gomorrah? Chapter 1, verse 16, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from mine eyes. Cease to do evil. And so we ask the question, what evil were they doing? Verse 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. God addressed a group of people who believed in him, called them people of Sodom and Gomorrah and said, here's what you need to do to fix this. Stop being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex. That's not what God said. Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow. Look at verse number 23. He further describes the state of the nation and the state of that people at the time. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come before them. The rulers, those in leadership, both in the religious realm and in the civil realm, were swayed by bribes. They were swayed by covetousness. They were swayed by material gain. And again is brought up the treatment, the judgment of the fatherless and the widows. And that's the sin that God condemns them of when he calls them people of Sodom and people of Gomorrah. 
There's nothing about uh, men sleeping with men or women sleeping with women mentioned anywhere in this passage, but he calls them people of Sodom. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah is another 100, 150 years after Isaiah. And Jeremiah 23 is a chapter that specifically addresses the preachers and the prophets and the pastors that were in Israel and in Jerusalem in that day. He's again going to make a comparison to Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Jeremiah 23, verse number 13, the Bible says, And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Once again, God likens those that are his people, those who are in his holy city, to Sodom and Gomorrah. And once again, the crime is not that they were waving pride flags in the windows of their churches and over their courthouses and over their city centers and their capitals. The crime is you have preachers and ministers and those who claim to be speaking for God who are committing adultery, who are dishonest, they're lying, and they are refusing to preach repentance from sin. And that's the crime of Sodom. He said, those who minister and those who open up God's word and proclaim it, are strengthening the hands of the evildoers. There are ministers, there are pastors, there are preachers, there are prophets that are telling people, God's okay with the way that you're living. God is fine with this. God's not going to punish this. God loves you. God accepts you. God is okay with this. And it says that the result was that none doth return from his wickedness. That was the sin that is likened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at Luke chapter 17. Let's fast forward another couple centuries. Luke chapter 17. We're trying to understand what specifically was the problem in Sodom. And if we'd asked that on a pop quiz in any Baptist church in the United States this morning, I suspect that 99.9% .9 of the answers would have had to do with, well, they were waving the pride flag and they had LGBTQ perversions going on, but the Bible gives us a little bit of a more complex picture. Luke 17, Jesus is teaching here and he's speaking about what it's going to be like when Jesus Christ comes back. Because Jesus Christ is coming back. Literal, bodily, visible, Jesus Christ will return to this earth. And here's how he describes what that's going to be like. Luke 17, verse 26 it says, And as it was in the days of Noe, that's the New Testament spelling of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. What happened in Noah's day? They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Well, now it gets even more complex because in this passage, there is nothing listed that is a sin. Look at the list. There's nothing sinful about eating. Have to do it to live. There's nothing sinful about drinking. There's nothing sinful that is, uh, certainly the Bible condemns drinking alcohol, but, but drinking as paired with eating. They bought Nothing wrong with buying. They sold. Nothing wrong with selling. Nothing wrong with planting. Nothing wrong with building. But that's what Jesus pointed to about Sodom's lifestyle and Sodom's culture when he said God destroyed that place. Hopefully this raises some questions in your mind. This is not the conventional narrative on either side of the aisle. This is not normally how we would preach about Sodom, but this is the way that Isaiah and Jeremiah and now Jesus refers to it. Turn to Jude, the second to last book of the Bible, Jude. Only has a single chapter, and let's look at verse number seven. This is the closest we get to what we would normally think of as the primary issue in Sodom. Jude, 
And the seventh verse says this, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And that's one of very, very few places in all of scripture where we could even try to make a, an argument that the single reason God destroyed Sodom was because of their sexual perversion. We could argue all day over what exactly strange flesh means. We're not going to dive into that at all. But what I'm trying to get you to see is that there's a lot more to God's judgment of Sodom than simply the pride flag waving over their town and the parades that marched through the street and surrounded Lot's house. There's more to it than that. Look at one more passage with me. Uh, Well, we'll have a couple more, but Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. I don't want you to think for a moment that I am trying to soften or... um, or change at all what our church believes the Bible teaches about human physical relations and human intimacy. That's not what I'm saying at all, and I want to make that very clear to you. Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus is a book where God is teaching his people how to be holy, his chosen people. And in Leviticus 18, in his book of instructions for how to be holy, he gives them a laundry list of how human physical relationships are supposed to work how human physical intimacy is supposed to be conducted and what the guidelines and the boundaries are. And without reading to you the entire chapter, here's the bottom line. God's plan is for a man who is married to a woman to be intimate and nothing else. That's the only acceptable way for that to take place. And so God condemns every other variety and every other form of this to include adultery, just as much of a sin. Uh, And he lists, uh, again, terrible, vile, wicked things. He lists incest and adultery and uh, bestiality and uh, homosexuality, which, again, is is, uh, perhaps on our minds as we think about Sodom and Pride Month. But look at verse number 24. After giving that list of everything other than a man who's married to a woman being together, this is God's conclusion. Every other kind of uh, physical relationship, here's what God has to say, defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Verse 27, for all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled. So I don't want you to think at all that God is okay with any of the things that are represented by a rainbow flag waving over any building or marching through any parade in our city. God is vehemently opposed to those things. But turn to Ezekiel chapter 16, and I think we find here ultimately the answer to why God destroyed Sodom. We're given actually a very explicit answer. And the question that we need to ask is, what is the takeaway in my life? Because it's very easy for us to look at uh, those who would wave a pride flag and those who would proclaim that we're proud of all these perversions and to say, I can't believe that people are that wicked. I can't believe that somebody would dare to do that. But God preaches about Sodom and Gomorrah to his people, to those who worship him and go to his house and make offerings to him. God has something to say to them using Sodom, and he's he's very clear about this. Look at Ezekiel 16, and before we read a verse, uh, again, this is one of those chapters that if you don't systematically read your Bible, you'd never believe that this is in God's holy Bible. This is what uh, you could think of. It's one of the most X-rated, explicit chapters in the Bible. It will shock you if you've never read it before. It's holy, God's words are pure, but it describes great impurity. And it's a a picture of Israel as God's wife and how God took care of Israel and how he uh, covenanted himself to love her and to bless her and to cleanse her and to save and protect her. And how Israel was spiritually adulterous in that relationship. And the words that you find throughout this chapter, these are Bible words, words like harlot and whore, and whoredom, and lewdness, and fornication. That's what Israel did spiritually. That's the context of this chapter. And in that context, God brings up the city of Sodom, 
But he doesn't speak about it the way that we would probably expect him to. Look at Ezekiel 16, verse number 49. The Bible says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. God's going to give us a direct, clear answer what the problem was in Sodom. Pride. Fullness of bread. An abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. If you were going to write one Bible verse to describe why God destroyed Sodom, that's probably not what it would have said. But God tells us exactly what the root issue was in that city. And he lists four or six things, depending on how you count. Here's why God destroyed Sodom because of pride. And I I find it fascinating that that is the self-chosen description of all the perversions that are celebrated in the month of June. It's pride month. But this isn't just about their pride. This is about pride in anybody's heart. Pride in your heart. Pride in my heart. That's what started Sodom down the wrong track is those who were proud. To be proud is to have a higher estimation of yourself than is justified. I think I'm better. I think I'm stronger. I think I'm more beautiful. I think I'm more righteous than I actually am. That's pride. And here's how pride creeps into every single one of our hearts. When you are proud you begin to develop the mindset that you should have a different standard that applies to you when it comes to sin. And so as we sit here, for every single one of us, we can look at the depravity and the perversion that our nation trumpets and celebrates from the capital city. And we say, I can't believe that there are people in my nation that are that wicked. I can't believe that there are people who would commit those kinds of horrible, wicked acts that I would never commit. And God says, proud. You're proud. And that's what caused Sodom to be destroyed, is they were proud. They thought they were better than they were. This was the sin of Sodom. And here's what we do when we're proud. We begin to excuse our sin. We can condemn the sins that we don't commit, but every single one of us has sins that happen in our lives that we struggle with and fight with and sometimes cling to and will eventually get to the point where we justify those things to ourselves. And I'm not going to go through a list. You know what sins are in your life. And God said, when you refuse to agree with me that you're just as vile and you're just as guilty because you violated my law, said so you're proud. That's what Romans 2 says about the Jews. Thou that teachest the law... You're transgressing the law. You preach against stealing, but you have underhanded business practices. You preach against lying, uh, but you stretch the truth and you are dishonest and you misrepresent and you're proud. When God made a list of the things that he hated in the book of Proverbs, number one on the list was a proud look. These six things doth the Lord hate. A seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look. This is the root of the issue in Sodom. Not only were they proud, they had fullness of bread. It's interesting because, again, if I just threw out that phrase, fullness of bread, as one of the top sins in the Bible and what got Sodom to be destroyed, put a quizzical look on your face. Fullness of bread. How is that one of the chief sins? The number two sin in Sodom was fullness of bread. Here's the deal. All of their appetites were satisfied. You put it this way, they were stuffed. If you're an American, you've experienced that because we're a rich, prosperous nation. I don't care what your socioeconomic status is. I suspect you've had the opportunity to be stuffed and full of bread. That's our country right now. And it's not just about the physical nutrition that is taken in. They're so full that there's no hunger and thirst and desire for the things that should be hungered for and thirsted for and desired for. This is the very temptation that Satan brought to Jesus as he fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. And Satan said, have some bread. Fill your stomach with bread. Gratify your body's desires. And Jesus said, we're going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
It's not about the bread that keeps me living. It's by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And in Sodom, they were so full and they were so wealthy and they had everything they needed and they had closets full of clothes and they had cars and boats and houses and food and money. And God said, they're so full, there's no hunger for me. That was the sin in Sodom. They're proud. They justified their sin, not just the sins that we would never do, but they thought of themselves more highly than they ought to have. They're full of bread, abundance of idleness, third on the list. To be idle, it's inactivity, insufficiently occupied. It's the opposite of virtuously redeeming the time, to be idle. And in our nation and in our culture, we have a society that is so full, one one leads to the other, we have so much prosperity, we have so much wealth, we have so much comfort, so much ease, so much leisure that uh, we believe a full work week is 40 hours. Eight hours a day, five days a week. That's not a biblical uh, description of a full work week. I like living in a rich nation. I like living in a prosperous nation. The, The prosperity is not the problem. The riches are not the problem. The problem is they took the wealth and the ease and the leisure and had abundance of idleness. And so the hours that no longer had to be worked in order just to survive, now it's hours spent sitting in front of a television. Now it's hours spent on hobbies. You know how rich of a country you have to be to have hobbies? I have to come up with things to do for fun because I have so much time that I don't have to be working. Abundance of idleness. They're staring at their phone. They're staring at YouTube and uh, Hulu and Disney Plus and and whatever else. I don't even know uh, what they all are. Abundance of idleness. And this is the sin that caused Sodom ultimately to be destroyed. Are we idle? Do we waste time? Do we take advantage of the prosperity and the wealth that God has allowed our nation to enjoy? How much time did we spend in front of a television or staring at a phone screen this week? I would never do what Sodom did. God said, are you idle? Are you full? Are you proud? That's the sin of Sodom. That's what caused them to be destroyed. That's what God's word is telling us here. It says that neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Despite their prosperity, despite having more food than they knew what to do with and more time than they knew what to do with, There was no effort made to look at anybody else other than themselves. It's a self-centered society. It's a self-centered culture. I've got hours to spend entertaining myself. I've got hours to spend amusing myself and my family. And meanwhile, God says there was plenty of bread. There was plenty of time, but there were poor and needy people. And nobody uh, reached out. Nobody strengthened them. Nobody was visiting the widows. Nobody was visiting the, uh, the fatherless. Nobody was caring for anybody but themselves. And that condition led them to verse number 50. They were haughty. That means they were proud plus contempt and despising other people. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. So God's not okay with the perversion and God's not okay with LGBTQ uh, plus add as many letters as you want. God's not okay with any of that. But he said, that's a symptom. The root is you had so much prosperity and so much pride and so much idleness and so much fullness of bread. And you're so self-centered and worried about nobody but yourself that you got haughty. You thought you were better than me. You didn't think you had to obey my commandments. The Bible says you despised government. You started to rebel against any authority in your life. That's when they committed abomination. And that's when God destroyed them. And we live in a nation, I I, I feel like as we read this description that fits this exactly, our, our nation has been blessed. Our nation is prosperous. Our nation is wealthy, which means that we are prosperous and blessed and wealthy. And if you look around our society, this is exactly the description of what's happened. And yes, there are uh, people trumpeting from the highest positions of government, uh, a celebration of and pride in all kinds of wickedness and perverseness. But God said the root of the matter is you took prosperity and you uh, just 
destroyed yourself in it rather than thanking me for it and continuing your, your love towards me and your dependence upon me. And the greater context of Ezekiel 16 talks about exactly that. Look at verse 47. Here's the amazing thing about this. God tells them what the sin of Sodom is, and what we're about to read is God saying, saying, you are worse than Sodom. Verse 47, Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if that were a very little thing, thou hast corrupted, thou hast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. Jerusalem, you're worse than Sodom. Verse 48, as I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. And here was the deal in the hearts of God's people. God had, so he had saved them, he had washed them, he had blessed them, he had loved them. He'd given them all kinds of security and prosperity and uh, just blessed them abundantly and their hearts turned aside from God, and their affection turned to the earthly goods that God gave them, and their hearts were, the uh, Bible describes them as weak. Uh, verse 30, how weak is thine heart? They strayed, and God said, after everything I've done for you, to you, for you to sit there and be proud and full and idle and arrogant and self-centered, that's worse than anything anybody in Sodom did. It destroyed them, it will destroy you, is what God told these people. And here's the way that the Bible sums up really the entire principle. This is from Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 32. The Bible says that the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. That's what happened in Sodom. That's what happened in Jerusalem. And I'm afraid that's what is happening right now in our nation. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. It's not wrong to be prosperous. It's not sinful to have money. It's not sinful to have food and clothes and cars and houses. But what do you do with that? What do you do with the time that's on your hands? What do you do with the resources that are on your hands? It's all about you and, and, and uh, your uh, lifestyle and, and you having every, all your appetites satisfied and uh, you having all kinds of time to waste and uh, it all being about your life or are we busy for the Lord? Are we humble before the Lord? Are, do we look at others' sin and say, there but for the grace of God goes I? Again, I'm not condoning anything that happened in Sodom. I'm not condoning any of the things that are being celebrated in our nation. But when we look at Sodom and when we look at pride and pride month from a biblical worldview, here's what we find. That behavior is abominable to God. He hates it just as much as he hates our pride, just as much as he hates our fullness and abundance and idleness and self-centeredness, sins that are just as prevalent in the heart of saved people sitting in Bible-preaching Baptist churches as they are in those that are marching through the streets of New York and San Francisco and Seattle this month. There's two men in the account of Sodom it's very instructive, the lives of these two men, when it comes to what we're supposed to do with this. We live in a wicked society. We live in a wicked culture. Again, we're promoting from the highest position of our land, calling upon the nations uh, or the, the citizens of our nation to celebrate and be proud of things that God says are an abomination. And there's two men that were around Sodom, two men that were believers in God, one was Lot and one was Abraham. Lot pitched his tent sword toward Sodom. I would never do the things that are going on in Sodom, but I'll see and hear it. I'll sit in the gate in Sodom. That was Lot's life. It ruined his family. He was saved. He made it out alive. God didn't destroy him with the fire and brimstone, but it wrecked his family, ruined his testimony. He did nothing for the city he lived in. But there's another man, we didn't read about him this morning, but if we were to turn a chapter earlier to Genesis 18, we would read about Abraham. Abraham kept himself separate from Sodom. Abraham didn't pitch his tent toward Sodom. He didn't live in Sodom. He didn't go toward Sodom. He stayed away from it. But here's what's fascinating to me is the attitude that Abraham had towards Sodom. Because this isn't the attitude we tend to have towards those kinds of things. God came and told Abraham, I'm going to destroy that city. It's wicked. I've had it up to here. It's tripped my line. 
I'm going to rain down fire and brimstone upon it. And Abraham went to God and begged and pleaded and said, God, would you have mercy on that city? And we understand uh, the account in Genesis 18. Again, Abraham uh, tried to, to um, strike an agreement with God. He said, what, if there's 50 righteous people in the city, would you save it for the sake of those 50 righteous? And he, and he talks them down to 10 righteous people. God, would you have mercy on that city for the sake of 10 righteous people? And as we drive around this month, as you see in the, the magazines and in the yard signs and window signs and parades and news headlines, all the wickedness and perversion that goes on in our country, to sit and sneer and despise it and puff ourselves up as being holier than thou is pride that God hates just as much as he hates all of that. And I would submit to you that our role as Christians living in a country and in a state and in a city like this would be to be like Abraham. I'm not going to be a part of it. I'm going to stay separate from it. I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to let it come in my uh, house via television or radio or TV or my phone or anything like that. I'll have no part of it. But my attitude is God have mercy on those people. God have mercy on me. Because I have pride in my heart. God, I'm full. God, I'm idle. God, I'm self-centered. Have mercy on me. And, and then the issue in Lot's life was there were supposed to be 10 righteous people in the city. If Lot and his family had been living the way God had intended them to, there would have been 10 righteous people in that city. It would have been spared. And so the question for us would be, am I righteous? If someone was looking down at my city and, and God's given directions to his angels to say, there's a place that's going to be destroyed, would he be able to count me as one of the righteous people, one of the reasons why God should have mercy because there's some righteousness there. Somebody who's separated, somebody who's uh, not proud, not full, not idle, not self-centered, but simply believing in God. And so the challenge this morning is for us not to be guilty of the sin of Sodom. And I don't suspect that anyone here probably uh, struggles with Again, the things that are represented by a, by a pride flag or by LGBTQ pride month. But are we humble? Are we broken before God because I'm a sinner and God hasn't condemned me yet? God forgave my sin. Are we hungry? Not for the food that we have so abundantly available to us. Am I that hungry for God's word? The Bible says, Proverbs 27, verse 7, that the full soul loatheth in honeycomb. You get so full of all the things this world has to offer. You get so full of money and possessions and fun and entertainment and enjoyment. The Bible says you'll loathe something that's sweet and delightful. It said, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. When you're hungry for righteousness, when you're hungry for God's word, even things that cut and even things that, uh, that pierce will be sweet to you because there's a desire for righteousness. That's what mitigates the sin of Sodom. We're to be busy, not idle. We have prosperity like few people in human history have. We have time on our hands. We don't think we do. We all have busy, 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 busy lives. We have time. Are we idle or are we busy? And that idleness, again, God told him where to direct it. He said there's people that are hurting. There's people that are poor. There's people that are needy. There's people that, and I'm not talking, certainly there's nothing wrong with uh, going and helping at a homeless shelter, a soup kitchen, but it's not just about people's physical needs. There's people that are spiritually starving. There's people that are emotionally broken and hurting. And God said, you've got fullness of bread. You've got abundance of idleness. You've got time and you've got resources. Go help somebody else. Stop letting it be all about you. And as we look at this, and again, it would, be, it would be very easy for me to stand up on a Sunday morning and rant and rage about lesbians and gays and bisexual and transgender, transgender and all the nonsense that goes on in our country. But God said, the way I judge things, if you take what I've given you 
and you're proud and full and idle and self-centered, you're worse than all that. Humble, hungry, busy, compassionate, serving the Lord by serving others. That's how we avoid the sin of Sodom.